So thank you for joining us today for the webinar. We've collected the data, now what? I'm Tony Felici, I'm the ACT Project Officer for the CESA MOOCs program, and I'm joined today by Celia Koffer from Victoria as the Victorian Project Officer. Collecting and representing data is, is a familiar ground for most primary school teachers, but we wanted to move further today um, onto the analysing and using data to answer questions and confirm predictions and also to use it to solve problems. We'll explore connections between data in the F to 6 digital technologies curriculum and the links with other learning areas and we'll be using weather data as our lens to explore this idea today. I'm coming from you to you today from the land of the Ngunnawal people. And I'm in Melbourne in the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continuing connections to the land, water and community. We pay respect to, their el to the elders, past, present and emerging. As I mentioned earlier, we are part of, a, part of the CESA program or Computer Science Education Research Program funded by the Australian Government Department of Education. We have, a, we have project officers in each jurisdiction and, all, and over the past four years, we've all been sharing with educators how to implement the digital technologies curriculum through a range of, of MOOCs, which is online courses, and a national lending library. You can read more and sign up to our newsletter at the website on this slide. I'm sure most of you here today have, have um, engaged with one of us over the past four years. Just a bit of housekeeping as we get started. If you've not used the Zoom environment, the tools are, um, are all on here. We're going to be using the annotation tool today for a couple of the interactive activities. Um, and if you could, uh, put que if you have questions, pop them in the chat um, or feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions as we go through. Uh, we're going to skip this part for the moment. Okay, so here are our broad intentions for the session today. We've provided some content, but there will be opportunities for you to contribute throughout. And we do encourage you to contribute and to share ideas and, and other resources that you've come across. The digital technologies curriculum is centered around creating digital, digital solutions and solving problems. And we know that data is critical for solving problems and, is, and if you search the Australian curriculum website, the term data across the entire F to, set, uh, F to 10 curriculum returns 609 matches. So data is important in many disciplines and we know that teachers find the curriculum very crowded. So it makes sense to look for opportunities where we can enhance the learning by um, engaging in cross-curricular opportunities. The curriculum was future-proofed by being written based on 10 key concepts. These concepts will exist while the content we teach may become outdated over the years. The concepts allow for cross-curricular connections and as you can see, data is an extremely prominent with three concepts addressing data. These focus, on, these focus on the properties of data, how they are collected, represented and interpreted in context to produce information. And we're going to look at these concepts to build on corresponding Oh, sorry, these concepts build on a corresponding statistics and probability strand in the maths curriculum. But what is data? So data are facts or numbers that can be collected and we can collect data on anything and use a digital device to analyze and evaluate. I'm gonna watch this video for a few minutes. It's a really great um, introduction to data. This short library video will introduce you to Data Basics. You'll learn what data is, why we use it, and how it is collected. Data is everywhere. It is a collection of facts. There's qualitative data, which is non-numerical data. The latte has a robust aroma, frothy appearance, 
and strong taste. It's in a blue cup. Qualitative data can be used to classify or categorize something. For example, if we have a box of shirts, we might collect shirt size data with categories such as small, medium, and large. Another example of categorical data could include hair color. There's also quantitative data, referring to a number. The latte contains 12 ounces of drink. It's served at 150 degrees Fahrenheit and costs $4.95. There are two different types of quantitative data. There's discrete data, which is a count and involves whole numbers. For instance, the number of children or adults or pets in your family is discrete because you can't have 2.5 kids or 1.2 pets at home. There's also continuous data. This is numerical data that can take on any value in a certain range, such as height or temperature. So, why do we use data? We use data for different reasons. Data can be used to answer a question or tell a story. Having a question to answer can provide focus and make it easier to find patterns within the data. For example, students that spend a lot of time on social media have poorer grades. You can also use data to tell a story. For example, when telling the story of climate change using data, we might use global temperature patterns, cycles, and greenhouse gases. Finally, how do we collect data? We collect data from primary and secondary sources. Primary sources is data collected by researchers such as interviews, observation, case studies, and questionnaires. Secondary sources is data that already exists such as official statistics, web information, government reports, and previous research. Need help? Email, chat, or drop by. So we're surrounded by data and we generate data, consume it and make, use data to make decisions to solve problems every day. And when we, when we check the weather, the numbers have already been crunched and presented to us in different ways. When we go to Google Maps, the app has taken all the data about the distance, traffic, et cetera, to present a best path and alternative for us to view, for us to, to travel. When you use uh, YouTube or Netflix, it's using our viewing data combined with people who have similar interests to, to make recommendations. There's nothing worse when um, my son, our, our son uses my Netflix account to uh, watch his videos and then I get all these random recommendations. So this um, video here, there have been a few made and this one was a, a really good one that we thought uh, has been updated and it's looking at if the world was only made of 100 people and it's been around for a few years or this whole concept has been around for a few years but we thought this was a great look, look at actually um, visualising data. Roughly 7.6 billion people share a life on planet Earth and that number is growing all the time. That's a lot of people. To understand what it actually means, let's simplify things a bit. Close your eyes and imagine what it would look like if the entire world was a village of just 100 people. In our global village, 50 people would be women and 50 men. A quarter of the village, 25 people, would be children under the age of 14. 66 villagers would be adults between the ages of 15 and 64 and the remaining nine people would be over the age of 65. Looking at the world map, just five of our 100 villagers would come from North America. Nine would hail from Latin America and the Caribbean, 10 from Europe, 16 from Africa, and a whopping 60 people would be from Asia. Australia's population, even if you include the neighboring islands, wouldn't even add up to one person in our global village. Our 100 villagers would hold many different religious beliefs. We would have 31 Christians, 23 Muslims, 15 Hindus, and 7 Buddhists. All the other religions would be represented by 8 people, and 16 people wouldn't identify with any particular religion. 
we would be a polyglot village too, speaking many languages. Considering only native speakers, 12 people would speak Mandarin, the largest group. Six would speak Spanish, five English, four Hindi, three would speak Arabic, three Bengali, and three Portuguese. Two would speak Russian, two Japanese, and a significant majority, 60 people, would speak nearly 7,000 other languages. Two-thirds of our village, which is 66 people, wouldn't have access to safe, affordable surgery, and 33 people wouldn't be able to afford the medicine they need. Nine people wouldn't have access to clean, safe drinking water. 14 wouldn't have access to toilets of any kind. 22 would have no shelter from the wind and rain. One villager would be dying of starvation, and another 11 would be undernourished. 22 would be overweight. 86 people in our village would be able to read and write, which means 14 would be illiterate. Of those 14, two-thirds would be women. Only 66 would finish high school, and of them, only seven villagers would go on to hold a college degree. While 18 people wouldn't have access to electricity, only five would not have access to a cell phone network. 47 people would be active internet users, which means 53 villagers would never be able to post photos, research anything online, or watch this video. Before we can change the world for the better, we need to understand what our world is like today. This is who we are. Imagine our village 50 years from now. What would you want it to look like then? Now open your eyes. There are 7.6 billion people waiting to see what you can do. So we thought that video really demonstrated um, what, can, what can be done with data after it's been collected, analyzed, and then represented in visual format, making it really easy to understand. We've also included a link on this slide at the bottom to um, a website, and Celia's putting the links in the chat too as we go through. And the, re the website takes you to um, a, a really good resource that can be used that identifies the four elements necessary for effective visualization of data. And it highlights how important the presentation of, the good presentation of data and how important that is. So understanding data is a skill that's becoming more important in the workforce. Data science is transforming the way we live and work and it involves and it is involved in many industries in medical science, social science, biology, robotics and the environment. Careers with STEM have some interesting articles highlighting careers involving data science and we just wanted to highlight that and um, direct you to that website as well. So we've identified that data is a collection of facts about something, but for it to become meaningful and useful, it needs to be transformed into information. Digital devices can be used to collect, store and process data into information that can then be interpreted and used to solve problems and answer questions. When you're collecting data, you typically start with a question or a problem, and we're going to focus a lot on that during this webinar. Celia, that's your one. Oh, sorry, I was responding to a comment. Oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Um, although we don't specifically cover um, cybersecurity and online safety in this session, um, it's important to realise that there's such a connection between um, data and cyber safety. Um, and we thought we'd just make you aware of a new other resources from our team about uh, that we have just um, presented, uh, some new MOOCs, particularly the one on cybersecurity and, cyber and, and awareness. There's also recently just been a, um, a new Netflix um, documentary. I'm wondering if anyone's already seen it about social, um, social dilemma. And it really highlights the use of data used by social media companies. Most of it not new to many of us, but it's a, it's a very um, powerful demonstration of the use of data. The Australian Curriculum Academy have unpacked the curriculum on their website, which is an excellent resource, and we've used some of their terminology through our slides today. As we mentioned earlier, the Australian Digital Technologies Curriculum is created around key concepts, and we're going to explore the three concepts, or the three data concepts in more detail in the band levels, 
and then examine the connections to other subject areas. Data collection for students in F2 is concrete and very hands-on. Counting and measuring data from objects and things in that they're familiar with in their known environments. They are expected to use pictures and symbols to represent data. You want them to identify, you want them to identify patterns, to make meaning from it and to answer simple yes and no questions. When it comes to interpreting data though, it is fact-based and they're not expected to make inferences about the data at this, at this initial level. So we don't expect you to read these slides. They're very text heavy, but we have used them. We have included them because we've identified the connections with, math, with data in math, HASS and science. And that demonstrates how much data is also a key element in these other subject areas. Both HASS and science have substrands that include a focus on questioning. Questioning encourages critical and creative thinking. The type of questions you will ask determine the type of, type of data that's going to be collected. Quantitative questions relate to numbers, which data is good at answering, and, and such things like what is the hottest day, what is the coldest day, the most, the most or the most frequent or the least frequent um, time something happens. Whereas qualitative data, qualitative data are descriptive or subjective. And when deciding on a jumper to buy, different people will have different data requirements, such as the cost or the size or the availability. When we're looking at time and place questions, these could be used to determine when a webinar should be scheduled to make it accessible to most teachers. And also how and why data helps to understand why events happen and they can identify and you can identify relationships between data sets. By years three to four, students should start to not only collect data from objects around them, but also to use data sources that are online, things like weather apps. We want them to understand that the same data can be represented in different ways. So the sun could be recorded as a symbol or, or a word. Understanding that and the way that data is represented will impact the usefulness of it is also really important at this level. If I recorded the daily temperature using tally marks, it would make it really difficult to interpret and also to be used to answer questions. A more useful representation would be using numerals and then simple software to visualize the data, organizing it in a way that can be interpreted and then used to answer other questions. I'd also identify the hottest, I could also then identify the hottest day and see the patterns in the daily temperature. Once again, you can see here in year three to four, how data is relevant in math, science and HASS. Statistics has an obvious strong connection and also in other areas where inquiry occurs and the need to ask questions. The answers are the data. For example, if students are creating inquiry questions in HASS, in year three HASS to explore how the main climate types of the world differ, they'll need to pose questions about different places, collect data, and then analyze and interpret it. So by, five to six, by years five to six in digital technology, students are expected to use a range of software when collecting and exploring data. They also need to present it in ways that allow them an opportunity to identify outliers and to validate the data to ensure that it's correct. Interpreting the data at this stage is to make in inferences, identify trends and also predictions. In years five and six, students should be collecting data via, could be de detected collecting data via sensors in digital systems, things like micro bits. An example is if students are creating inquiry questions in year six science, which explores extreme weather events, it's a great opportunity to explore data sets surrounding natural disasters. When exploring the connections between the growth and the survival of living things, they can pose questions regarding the effect of watering on a plant, Use it and use a digital tool to collect the moisture data and then program a sprinkler system to turn it on and off, depending on the optimal moisture levels that they've determined by studying their data. We know that Martin Levins has a lot of great resources for smart gardens on his YouTube channel. So Martin, if, you're, if you want to add that link down below, that would be great. And any other resources that um, you would like to share? We know Peter has also been doing a lot of work with smart gardens. 
When talking about data, it's hard to ignore the obvious connections to critical thinking. When we pose questions and process the resulting data into information, it's, very, it's a very similar process to the mathematical and science inquiry process. Schools are increasingly working in cross-curricular methods, whether it be inquiry, project-based learning or STEM. And these processes all hinge around the, the idea of exploring problems or ideas, asking big questions and then working through a process. It doesn't matter what you call it. All of these approaches follow similar processes, starting with defining the problem or asking questions and then determining what data is required to unpack it. The skills of data collection, representation and the important step of interpretation. Asking questions and using data are inherently linked. So there's been a lot of us talking so far and now it's your turn to contribute and share your ideas, which will make this, uh, this webinar a little bit more interactive. We want to um, ask you, what are some of the data collection techniques that you use or that you have, um, you have ideas that you can share? We're going to use the annotate tool uh, on this slide for you to be able to share some of your ideas or feel free to un unmute yourself and share them verbally. So if you haven't used um, the annotate tool before, it's up the top, um, you'll see a button that says, or a drop down, it says view options. Select that and then scroll down to annotate and people are already doing it. Um, and give us some ideas as to the ways you have um, uh, used, what data collection techniques you've used with students. You might even want to tell us what level you think it's suitable for. You don't have to, but if you wanted to add that, that'd be great. Oh, hi there. It's Pete. Yep, it's me. Uh, look, I was just going to suggest that I've put up a little link there that might be of use, put together by uh, one of our DOE educators, uh, Bob Elliott. And I know that Martin has also got some really lovely videos that he's done around the um, work of the smart garden tools using microbits and a really clear explanation. I'm hoping that Martin might share that, which is fantastic. There's one use of data that the schools are using around digital technologies that we're using in a couple of schools where Mona have provided smart garden support for schools through their, um, their garden project, which they call the 24 Carat Gardens. And I'll put that link in in a moment. And where the children are collecting data all the time about what are the best environments for their gardens. So there's a little bit of that work going along and also in the agricultural colleges at Hagley where they're using um, a whole range of devices to record data and get the students to look at how important agricultural statistics and data is for uh, cropping. So I'll put those links that I have up, and, but this is a, a really useful conversation. Thank you. Thanks for, that, thanks for that Tasmanian perspective, Pete. And Martin has already shared in the notes um, in the chat his um, smart, uh, a smart playlist um, and we'll add that to the notes at the end of the document as well. That's great. So we've got surveys, Google Forms. Um, you'll see when one of the examples we're showing later includes Google Forms in quite a clever way. Um, Kahoot, all levels. Um, someone might need to explain how you use Kahoot as a, as a data collection tool. Oh, I suppose it's a, of course, you use it for form, asking questions and getting responses, don't you? I think of it as a quiz, which is, of course, a data collection. <laughs> Took me a moment to get there. <laughs> Manual collection, that's also important that we're doing it without... Um being able to do manual collection as well. There's many um, sites where you can also collect, have, there are data sets ready available. Um, the data.gov and the AdSci one are both um, referenced later in our document as well. Um, Bureau of Meteorology has amazing ones as well. So okay. one of the things we did notice when um, we were putting together the information for the cybersecurity um, MOOC was um, around the collection of data and around private and personal information. So when your students are collecting data in surveys for their own digital solutions, having that conversation about what kind of data they are collecting from other people and, and do they need the personal data to, um, you know, we, we're asking, we often ask people for the name and, and uh, the, you know, first and surname and last name and do you really need that data and is that then 
um, creating an issue with security and, and privacy. So it's just something to think about as well. So as students, as researchers, if they're, if they're asking, creating forms or creating any surveys, question whether they need to put private information on, be collecting private information. And if they are, are they telling people they're collecting it and what are they doing with it? The same as with um, collection policies at schools. Okay, should we move on to the next one, Tony? Yeah. Did you save that slide off? No, I didn't. We've um, just updated the Zoom and now we, you can um, remote control each other's screen. So sometimes when I went to move the mouse, Celia had already been, <laughs> been moving it and then I was, couldn't move it any further. Okay, that one's saved up. Thanks. I need to go back to the mouse to go to the next slide. So we're going to ask you again, so what are some data representation techniques? So how could you, how do you represent the data? What are some of the ways that you use data representation with your students or in the classroom? And we just do it verbally if you like for this one, if you have anything. Otherwise, we've got some more things for you to do so we can keep going. <laughs> Actually, we might go to the next one. The next one's okay. fun. Do you want me to wait? Wait for just one more minute. Okay. People going there. Yeah, I'll chip in at this point. I think there's one of the big issues that I've noticed and, and we have talked about a lot, Pete, and you guys have probably noticed this as well at CSER, and that is that. Um, Mathematics calls data representation the things that are appearing now, infographs and pictographs, whereas computing science and um, the digital technologies curriculum is referring to how data is represented to a computer. And there's a confusion between them and it makes a clear distinction between data representation and uh, data uh, visualization which I think I might be stealing you guys thunder a little bit um, mm -hmm. apologize if that's the case but um, we I just did an interesting exercise today on data representation by getting some kids in three four five and six to analyze the movements of animals and represent the behavior of animals as stick figures uh, so that we then use that to choreograph a dance of a hunter and a kangaroo to bring in the cross-curricular um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and culture. Uh, I think I'm, I think I'm treating all your guys to no. <laughs> see my no. Tony's <laughs> smile. You guys are going to address this, aren't you? Uh, no, no, we're not going. We weren't addressing that. So that, that's great. We're we're encouraging you. That's fantastic. I love the bringing the Indigenous in perspective into it. Well, the, you know, the things like um, I could represent, uh, where are we? I could represent a concept by saying, how do I do this? I could represent a concept by saying two. I could represent the same concept by saying that. I could represent the same concept by representing that. I could represent the same concept by doing that. I could also represent the same concept by doing, whoops, by doing that. Are you typing on something? Because it's not showing up, no? It's not coming up? No. Oh, no, it did, no. yes, yes. Yeah, sorry, it obviously takes a, it, it doesn't come up until you, I now can't move it. That'll do, you can see it all. Yeah, that's good. The, the yeah. same concept is represented by five different entities. Yeah. So ultimately, we want kids to understand that the last illustration there, one zero, is the way that that data is represented to a computer as a binary number. But ultimately, that's actually represented as a fluctuation in voltage. <laughs> you know, so that, that, whereas mathematics talks about data representation as drawing graphs, infographs, and pictographs. Whereas data representation in the digital technologies curriculum is how data is represented, not how it's visualized. But mathematics uses data representation to mean visualization. 
which is a bit of a, an yeah. issue, cross-curricular issue. <clears throat> and we're trying today to sort of work out, to, to expose how using cross-curricular <laughs> ideas where you would um, we'd be using the infographics and pictographs can actually help with the whole data um, interpretation element that we're heading towards. Does that all make sense? Yeah, it's really difficult with young kids because they represent, say, an amount of data by visualising it. <laughs> like in, yeah. in levels one and two, it's, it's a little bit awkward, but ultimately, data representation boils down to use of variables, naming variables, um, code becomes data, um, and ultimately the ones and zeros. Yeah, anyway. yeah and that is a hard yeah. concept to teach in those early years, definitely. Um, all right, so we're going to um, move you on now to Jamboard. Um, Silly's put the link in, in there as well. We won't spend a lot of time on this because we are um, yeah, running, <laughs> running through the time, which, which is fine. Um, but we wanted to talk again about taking that different ways that the same data can be, um, can be represented. So having a look at this kale back of this seed packet here, and it has telling you a lot of different information on here. So having a look at this, I don't know whether it's big enough for you to be able to see, but Celia's putting in, there was another link to the actual website where we got the image from, that you might be able to make it bigger that way. Yep, just a minute. And having a look on here and interpreting, interpreting the information on the back of this packet to tell us what you know, what it's telling you, or, or composing a question that can, that can re be required to, inter someone else can interpret it using the, the information on the packet. So we've got the beginning there that it's not time to plant kale in Melbourne in September. What else is the data? telling us or the information telling us? What questions could you ask, pose to students to get them to actually be interpreting that data? Now, have you all used Jamboard before? We'll, we'll know in a moment. Ooh. You really just be using the text box. <laughs> That's or it. you can use the post-it notes. <laughs> yeah, Martin obviously is not a friend of Kale. <laughs> I really like using um, Jamboard. The only issue I have with it is that giving people access to be able to edit, edit it gives them access to edit everything on there. So um, that can become problematic at some, sometimes, but um, I do like it as a tool to be able to interact and share with people. I thought that too, Martin, but Celia tells me that kale is lovely when it's baked in the oven and becomes kale chips. I don't know, she hasn't convinced me. <laughs> Distance between plants, yep, colour shapes. The distance between plants, um, we were talking before about bringing that into, into maths, a maths activity as well and giving students, telling them you want to plant a certain amount of plants and then working out how big the garden bed would need to be for that by using the, the information on the back of the pack. I think um, we need to move on a bit, Tony. Yeah. So the, um, the slide, on, the next slide, I'm just going to click to the next one on here as well. And this was just another activity where you're looking to interpret um, two different pieces of information to compose a question that would require you to be able to read both, both parts of this information that was shared. We'll go back to the webinar or the slides. Okay, so we chose weather today as our lens to explore data because of the cross-curricular connections it provides, particularly in science, math and HASS. And we're going, we are going to collect data, identify the role of data, and then share a process that we've been developing and working on to ensure the interpretation stage is clearly identified. And um, we, we would love your feedback and, and um, contribution to this. It's um, a really, uh, a process that, as, as I said, we're working on. So we'd be, able, we'd be happy to have some feedback. 
We were going to do this activity. I don't think we've got time now, Celia. No, I agree. Um, uh, the, so this one was wanting to collect the data from you and knowing your information about what you know about weather. But we did conduct it already and collected some, all of this information about weather. And then we went through using the hexagonal thinking to find the connections and then to identify um, where data or where the weather could be measured using different, different um, tools. So it has attributes, it can be measured, um, Celsius or Fahrenheit, it can be recorded, it can be predicted. And as you got into more depth into each of these sections, you could um, build it out further. You could get students to create um, mind maps from each of these concepts and, and make the connections with it. So this is our process. So as, as Tony just said, we are just developing this and we're really happy for some feedback. But we've tried to, des to describe the process where we use data to help answer questions or solve a problem. It obviously starts with identifying a problem or simply asking a question. We wouldn't be suggesting necessarily that you would actually, you know, I itemise every step of this with students. It might just be something that you have in the back of your mind when you're um, working with, stu with students and need a process that you want them to go through and you can guide them through it. Um, so you'd start, the, po the questions would be posed by students in most cases in a good inquiry model that they're student-based questions. Um, but sometimes those questions might be guided by teachers. Obviously they need to sometimes be taught how to um, write good questions. Uh, once you've got the question, um, you need to identify the data that you need to answer it. Uh, after you've, um, and ha then you're gonna work out, well, I need some of that data. How am I going to collect that data? And what's the best way to collect that for the type of data I'm trying to collect? And then once you've done that, you'll probably need to represent it in some way to visualize it as, as Martin talk, uh, refers to um, and is in the maths, I mean the, the maths curriculum. Uh, how are you gonna visualize that to help you interpret it? And then we'll um, then move on to the, to the actual interpretation of that data. What methods would you look at? How would, um, with all students, you look at, are there patterns in that data? Does the, da does the data you've collected actually help answer the question? Um, does it have, help you answer other questions? Does it actually provide information that gives you, leads you in another direction? Um, as I said, teachers could um, choose to be used this potentially explicitly with students in that process or just have it in the back of their minds as to a process that you want, how you want students to be thinking about the process of the data. So we're so, looking at, oh, go Celia, no, you keep going. <laughs> so what we've done here is we've actually provided a few examples in each year level. Um, we don't intend on going through them individually. So this is sort of the linear version of that um, chart that we've just been through. We were basically going through the process to make sure that it did sort of make sense in the, in the classroom content context. So the questions that we've put in there, the identifying problems or posing questions, are. Uh, just broad examples. Um, we would definitely hope that those, those questions would actually be student-led questions based on what their inquiry or their um, project-based learning processes were. Um, we just, you've had a chance to have a little look at those while we'll be talking. We're gonna unpack the, each one, one of them a little bit more in the next slide, Tony. Um, Martin's just heading off. And yes, Martin, we would, always helping, always happy to have help with the development of these things. So, yep, well, be in touch. Yeah, it'd be great to work with you guys. You do such wonderful work. So, um, it just makes us look good. Yep, <laughs> they're fantastic. Well, see you later. Thanks. See, for that. see you, Martin. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Martin. Um, okay, so this is um, we we developed we broke um, yeah expanded on one activity. I've lost my thought now. One activity in each year, each of the band levels. So, looking here at the um, the collecting data on the clouds. So starting off with, does the sky change during the day? Do the clouds change I'll every day? I'll just stop you, Tony. We're, we're talking about the real clouds now. We're not talking about those ones that yes. you know, we often talk about, the cloud. The These cloud. are the ones in the sky. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, fun fact, when you Google uh, cloud data or cloud data and cloud, it all comes up. Your first hits are always coming up for data storage in the cloud. But no, we're talking about the real clouds. That's right. 
Um, uh, what data are we going to collect? Well, we're looking at the cloud information, cloud cover information, and the way we could do that is through sky observations or vocabulary, using set times of the day to draw the clouds you see out the window or to take digital photos. And then representing that using, again, words or drawings or cotton wool clouds, getting students to make the cotton wool clouds. And then focusing on that interpreting stage. So sorting the cloud into different categories and colours and sizes, placing them along a timeline of the day, writing sentences such as in the morning it was and, it, and describing it. And then in, our, in that process that we're developing, what more, what extra information does it tell us? Did it actually answer our original questions? And if so, what else does it tell us? But if not, what else do we need to know? So thinking about what cloud or sky would make you think you need your hat or, or raincoat, what are the changes in the sky? And then also, if we continue this over the year, what are the changes related to the different seasons? So you could um, extend it out over the, over the year. Just before we go on any further, does anyone have any comments on that, on that one? Go back, Tony. And then just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to say anything if they have some ways for us to improve that or other, other ideas they might use for something like that at, at the junior level. Um, one thing that I was just typing in where you've got does the cloud, you know, predict any type of weather, yes. um, you can link it in to um, Indigenous um, law because they actually do have cloud formation into weather and what they plant and what will happen. So it's just another link. Beautiful. Yeah, that's great. Okay, sorry. It's okay. Um, three to four as well. We've got these, you know, different activities that we've looked at, but I'll keep going so we can go into more depth with those, the ones we've expanded, expanded on. Oops, too far. So at this level, we've looked at the UV protection or the UV um, ratings. So questions are, do we, protect, do we protect ourselves from the UV today? What time of day is the UV rating the lowest? And does the temperature change the UV level and what does UV do? Collecting the levels, so going on to, uh, and also data and temperature. So looking at those uh, temperature data, looking at those connections between that. Uh, collecting methods, looking at apps or websites, the UV Smart Alert, or we've also put a link to a, um, a UV collector or UV meter from JCAR that you could actually collect the UV at your location. Representing it using bar graphs, line graphs, picture tables and graphs. And then the interpret stage is looking at does the UV rating change in different seasons at different times of the day? Is the UV rating different in other parts of Australia? And when is the UV rating the highest? And taking that even further, getting the students could, could create a scratch program demonstrating their understanding of the UV rating, um, proposed changes to recess or lunch times, um, and actually looking at why do they need to look at sunscreen? How, um, not only that, yes, they need to apply a hat and sunscreen, but how often do they need to reapply that? And so they could create um, a system that would tell the students how often they would need to come in and replace their sunscreen. And again, if anyone has anything to add to this, please um, unmute yourselves or type it in, type it into the chat. We'd love to have your contributions. Once we're up here into five and six, we um, again have three activities and the ones we're unpacking aren't actually listed on this one at this time. So these are additional ones. So with five and six, the activities, the problem here was that we started with, was that during lunch and recess, the student playground monitors would constantly ask the teacher what the temperature was so that they knew when they had to play under the shaded areas or to go outside or to go inside, sorry. They had to decide, they decided to create a temperature alert monitor using micro bits to alert them when the temperature got to, a, to the danger level. And the same idea could be used with extreme weather. 
for us in Canberra, we don't have to worry too much about that extreme heat, but uh, the cold is often, often uh, it, it affecting us here. Um, the collection of the data um, could be using the current temperatures and using re during recess and lunchtime. Also, they could be using microbit sensors to collect it actually at the school, digital thermometers, and then also the weather app. Um, and looking at, if we're moving down to that interpret stage, looking at, is there a pattern when the temperature is the highest? Could we change break times again? Um, and using the microbit sensors and the digital thermometer and the weather app, they could also check to validate their data. So looking at um, multiple sources of data to make sure that their data is accurate. Taking that further, they could create an alarm system to alert them when the temperature reaches trigger points and then to play in the shade and or creating a warning signal to or a warning system for them to as a reminder to drink more water at a set temperature and to stay hydrated. Um, collecting then temperature in the sun and the shade for comparison and seeing whether or not um, you know, yes, they're out of the UV in the, in the shade, which, which is a benefit, but is it a lot cooler in the shade? Oh, I like that one, time-lapse photography by Maria. Maria, that, great. And there's another one that could be used for many, um, for many questions, the ones we've posed with the idea of perhaps them planning a holiday and wanting to choose a holiday spot so they could have the smallest amount of clothes in their backpack perhaps. So they're only going to go to places where the temperature was above 25 degrees. And they wanted to collect their own data because they wanted to go to particular places um, to visit friends who they blogged with. So the um, students could use a, uh, so the sort of data they needed was the temperature in the different places. Um, they could use, and I actually did this with a group of students, they used a Google form to collect data. Um, they, they managed to get people to, to know the form existed by sharing it on their blog post or via Twitter with the, with the teacher's account. So they collected their, their set of data um, and with a Google form, you, it automatically creates a spreadsheet. And with that spreadsheet, you can either um, represent the data with um, bar graphs, or in this case, what we did was we um, uploaded the, uh, the, the data from the spreadsheet into a Google My Maps. So they had the ability to visualize very clearly um, where, the, the da where the places they had, had data from are and the, the conditions of, the, of those places. If you can, um, I have the link um, in the notes later, um, you can actually then identify from this image um, uh, by clicking on the different little placeholders where the people, where the places are on their temperatures. So they have the ability to actually plan their route by looking at it on the Google My Map. Um, and from that, they could then, you know, come back to many other ways of interpreting that data, sorting it into temperature zones so they could work out their, the path, the, the itinerary. Um, it could be for hot weather or cold weather, so skiing or which, whichever types of places. The other thing, um, I'm not sure whether you can see on this map on the data because it is quite small, but um, one of the temperature, it says 85 degrees. And so talking about that as an outlier and why would that be so, so different to all the other, other data and talking about the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius and recording that in different areas. Oh, that's actually really good, time, good timing at times run away <laughs> with about eight minutes to go. Um, we are really welcoming any thoughts you may or may not have about our process um, and ways you think it could be adapted. Um, we've given you know the, this circular version here and we've given the, the linear examples um, but we are very happy to say that this is not the end of this thought process. We'd like to have some feedback from you if you had any um, about how this may or may not help you work with students to actually explore the, the data concepts in the curriculum cross curricula. And so we've used weather. If you've got an example other than weather or a way that you think this could be useful, we'd be really grateful to hear from you. Uh, I was just thinking about the literacy and numeracy progressions uh, as being the tool or the examples I use to try and capture the staff that I work with in the Tasmanian schools where that is, for, I know, for many states, the key learning areas that 
teachers are being guided towards. But to try and get them to digital technologies is also to look at how literature contains all sorts of data that children could be looking at. Um, and particularly, in, and also in numeracy, of course, there's lots and lots of examples, but it's a, it's a way that we've, we've been using to get the teachers to see how that cross-curricular cross uh, activities really do work well, not only engaging children, and that doesn't have to be with digital devices. We've been doing things with all sorts of other activities, even just barcodes, unplugged activities from the CS Unplugged tasks of Tim Bell that we're using all the time to try and capture the data activities you're talking about so beautifully here, but also allowing teachers to feel safe to use them because they're actually doing literacy and numeracy. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, given the time, we, um, we've just thrown that at you. We don't expect, it might be a bit harsh to ask, ask for um, well thought out answers in this period of time. We might just move on to our concluding slides, which are some of the suggested resources. Um, Tony. <laughs> uh, we just collated a few here for you. So the Digital Technologies Hub has loads of lesson plans and resources available for teachers. The Indigenous weather maps, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, people have developed an intricate understanding of the environment, which is what Joy mentioned um, earlier in the webinar to us when we were looking at the clouds. And the images on this slide are linked to the Indigenous weather knowledge map and Celia will also um, pop it into the... I think you've got that one. To you will. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we've also included a link to the DTIF resources for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander connections to digital technologies. And these include a number of worked examples for you to be able to access. The Bureau of Meteorology has great, um, an awesome amount of data. And you can also um, select it. You've got, you've got this selecting um, text and so you can actually um, target different areas for the data you're looking for. Australian Data in Science Institute with Linda McIver. On this website, the link we've put here for the Educational Data Set Companion um, is a really useful resource for you to be able to access and, and um, she's also got some great data, data sets on her website ready to be, to be able to access and to use with students. We've also got links to our own resources that support this presentation um, within our uh, Digital Technologies Foundation unit, Foundation MOOC. We have, um, there are three units on, pat on data, looking at patterns and play representation, and then also data security in our cyber awareness and, and cyber security and awareness MOOCs. We've also got um, the, in the lending library, we mentioned microbits a fair bit today. Is some of the example, a good tool for collecting data. Um, we do have microbit kits available in our lending library that is uh, um, open for business at the moment. Our MOOCs, which some of you may or may not be aware of, I think most of the people in this room are, but we have massive open online courses um, and you would have, may and may, we've already mentioned this new cybersecurity MOOC, but obviously teaching AI in the classroom has big connections to data as well. So they are free online and self-paced learning opportunities for teachers. So thank you everybody. Um, for joining us today. We all have at that perfect timing. Um, I'm going to pop the link in there to, uh, for, a, for the feedback. If you wouldn't mind giving us some feedback, probably easiest to do it now if you're online still. Um, whoops, the wrong button. Uh, so we'd really value any feedback, ideas for future webinars um, or feedback on this one. And I'll find the chat and pop that in. And keep in touch with us via our social media um, accounts or um, the website, sign up to the newsletter, use our hashtag season MOOCs. Um, the project offices are all available still in each state and territory to be able to help and support schools um, in a virtual capacity most, in most states because of um, current restrictions and travel issues and things. But um, we are still all available, so please get in touch if we can help you in any way. 
I've just noticed in the chat, um, Jane mentioned music, video and books data could be another key data area for students' investigation now that shopping and streaming platforms capture so much data. Great to also see how it influences our lives. Well and truly. <clears throat> Jane, did you want to speak to that or are you happy with that? Take silence. Nope, you don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 